This program is rated 14 plus and may contain mature subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome to Cry Beat. I'm Anthony Robart. Tonight, a young mother and former beauty queen is gunned down in the prime of her life in a quiet suburb of Vancouver. Red Firebird came straight down here and I pumped about 10 shots into the car. Like, why would somebody kill a dental assistant? Family members of Alexandra Amber Pesek say there is more to her death than a simple drive-by shooting. We uh, did receive a number of tips. However, uh, we were actively investigating the suspects in this case the, uh, the day after the murder. So we said, well, we got to talk to this guy and decided to pull him over. And as they approached the vehicle, he got out of his, his uh, car and $30,000 fell out of his shorts. I knew that she was uh, scared for her life. I didn't believe it was going to happen. Here now is Jules Knox with The Hired Hit. Coquitlam, British Columbia is a suburb of Vancouver, and it's grown rapidly since becoming a city 30 years ago. At that time, it was a quiet bedroom community that was home to about 100,000 people. And on August 5th, 1992, dentist Dr. Alan Carroll was inside his office, finishing up for the day. Just a normal routine dental day with uh, doing procedures, and uh, the day went on and then we finished. We were all leaving. Uh, Alex left before I did. It was around six in the evening in Coquitlam and still light out when Alexander Pesic, who worked as a dental assistant, headed to her car. Red Firebird, just like hers, or a Camaro came straight down here, slowed down or either stopped right beside her, and I pumped about 10 shots into the car, huh? 10 or less. Where were and you at the time? I was uh, right over on that corner over there. What'd yeah. you do? Uh, I ran over to the car, and there was one other guy there. Just sitting in there having a coffee, and uh, heard like five or six shots, and uh, came running out. About 15 seconds later, I looked in the car, and there was uh, some chick slumped in a pool of blood. The window was all shot out and she was laying there in blood and people started gathering around and that was basically about it. It was pretty shocking. Her companion, the woman in white pants, happened to bend over to adjust a handbag just as the shots were fired and that may have saved her life. Then as the suspect car sped away, another shot was fired. By the time I left, I walked down the stairs. Her car was on, on the street and she was in the driver's seat, slumped over. The scene looked quite surreal. You, you, you can't believe what happened. We checked for a pulse and it was super faint. And so, well, before we even got out of the car, the police were there. And the police officer and myself held towels or whatever, one on each side of her head. She had two holes in her head. Whereabouts? Uh, one was back here and the other one was down near the throat. Alexander was still alive when the first police officer was on the scene. Um, ambulance was called. She was taken uh, to the hospital. How are you feeling right now? Uh, shaking up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so you got a bit of blood on your hands yeah, and so bit. on. Alex died on the way to hospital, three weeks short of her 26th birthday. Any idea of a motive for this? Uh, at this time, that's kind of unclear. Uh, however, this is not a random drive-by shooting. This uh, victim, in our opinion, was selected. For hours, two men had been sitting in a red IROC, so a pretty hot car, and that people noticed. Was it sort of lurking around, or was it just driving no. around? Was there something that, that made you go, something's not right well, here? it's just, it would come down the same road, and always it would always come up Whiting Way and then go straight down Cottonwood to North Road, eh? and it just seemed to circle the block a few times. Everybody went in this grocery store and saw that red eye rock, these two guys sitting with, with the baseball caps and sunglasses on and kind of sleazy looking guys. Why are they, they thought maybe they were gonna rob the store. 
The driver is described as uh, early to mid 20s. Very dark shoulder length hair, wavy, larger than average nose. So the passenger is also early 20s to mid 20s. Stringy, greasy shoulder length brown hair, or a week's growth of beard, long face with high cheekbones. They could watch her car from the grocery store. And as soon as she was getting towards her car, they pulled out, pulled up beside her, had a semi-automatic and shot her. Certainly not one that we'd uh, call a crime of passion, uh, a hit situation. Sort of hired killers. That's what we're speculating as. Like, why would somebody kill a dental assistant in a drive-by shooting? It's almost like a gangster murder. You know, she was a beauty queen. Alexandra Ignatovic. As a 17-year-old, Alex was the runner-up in the 1984 Miss Burnaby pageant. Great. Good evening, everyone. My name is Alexandra Ignatovic, and I represent Burnaby, BC. My she went on to compete in the Miss Canada contest. When she would go out, people would notice her. She was very uh, assertive and self-confident, quite capable and, you know, very, a very pleasant person, nice personality. Alex was this beautiful, tall, beautiful blonde who had no enemies. Everybody loved her. She worked with dental assistants, not a place where you garner enemies, right? Alex and her mother, Zdenka Ignatovic, were close. And they used to go to open houses in search of their future dream home. At one of the open houses, they met uh, the Pesic family, Yelka. And they noticed that she spoke Yugoslavian, and they were Yugoslavian. Yelka Pesic and her husband, Sava, who also goes by Sam, ran the auto repair shop Sam & Sons near Main Street in Vancouver. Yelka told Alex she should stop by. Alexandra showed up at the Pesic garage to get her tail light fixed, and... Uh, met Joe there and they ended up going out and, and dating. It was like an instant attraction. Apparently he would bring her flowers every time they dated and took her to really nice restaurants and he had a motorcycle and they'd go riding. So it was kind of a whirlwind romance and she was really happy. Their wedding, which occurred after a courtship of less than one month. The pair held their reception at Fantasy Gardens in June of 1988. And so, your impression of their wedding when you were taking pictures? Yes. What was it? Your impression of the wedding? Ah, uh, my impression is very happy style. They in fantasy garden. Alessandra is like to make everything very fancy. You know, very colorful. And Joe go with it. What was Joe like? Very quiet. Very non-assuming. That's why, um, in many ways, both uh, Yelka and Saba thought Joe had really hit a home run in getting a girl like uh, Alexandra, who was so vivacious and attractive. The newly married couple soon had a baby and named him Brandon, but their married bliss was short and the pair went their separate ways. Brandon was three years old when his mother was gunned down. Coming up after the break, before her murder, Alexandra told police she was being threatened and stalked by persons unknown. After Alexandra Pesic is gunned down in a brazen daylight shooting, details emerge about a disturbing book sent to her before her murder. We now return to Jules Knox and the hired hit. Inside Alex's home, her mother was stricken by grief. And as she prepared to bury her only daughter, she was also caring for her grandson. When he have to go to bed, Early in the morning, he asked him for his mother because she used to put him in a bed herself. And now you do that? Now I do that, yes. I knew that she was uh, scared for her life. I didn't believe it was going to happen, but 
she was scared and she told me that she wished me to look after Brandon in case that something happened to her. Family members of Alexandra Amber Pesek are devastated by her murder. They say there is more to her death than a simple drive-by shooting. Recently, a copy of the Cindy James book was sent to her with highlighted passages. Police confirm the last three years of her life may have been hell. Neil Hall is the author of The Deaths of Cindy James, a true story that unfolded in and around Vancouver in the late 80s. It was the most bizarre case I'd ever written about. It was a woman found hogtied with her hands tied behind her back. She would be found a number of times in ditches with like a black stocking tied around her neck. The uh, black nylon in the center were around the victim's hands. A second nylon was around her neck. The first officer on the scene thought she was dead. Her breathing was so slow. She hired a private investigator and she had a panic button and he went over there and he found a, a note, uh, you know, stabbed a knife through her hand with a note attached saying, now you're gonna die. In April 1986, the latest in a string of violent events in James's life saw fire break out in her house. Investigators determined it was deliberately set. So on four occasions, she was uh, assaulted, beaten up, strangled and stabbed in, in, in some instances. And her house on one occasion was set on fire. That's right. Over an eight year period. That is right. She felt the police thought she was making too much of the incident. Did your daughter know who was attacking her? I really don't think so, but of course she was threatened that if she ever told the police, that would be the end of her. Five days before her 45th birthday, Cindy James was again found tied up. She had been dead for 13 days. It was an eight year reign of terror. All these incidents I detailed in my book and, and these were the things that uh, were used to kind of terrorize Alex Pesek. Like Cindy James, Alex felt she was being followed. She was coming home from an evening out, was going back to her mother's residence and a car followed her and she felt threatened at the time and she got out of the car and ran into the house. And a man chased her from that particular vehicle. He was uh, wearing a mask and she ran and just got inside the door of her uh, residence, slammed it shut, <clears throat> turned on the light and screamed. That scream I will never forget that I heard. Friends of Alexandra Pesek say they're afraid to speak out on camera. But off camera, they say that she was threatened and stalked by persons unknown for three years and that she was angry police did not take her complaints seriously enough. A couple of times of uh, attempted being run off the road in her car. But did someone just drive up and try and push her off the road? Yeah, yeah, and just she doesn't know who they are or anything. She told me that she had to um, wear a wig and basically be incognito because she feared for her life. Her house had been um, torched, that somebody had started the front yard on fire. And that is one of the chilling passages highlighted in the Cindy James book sent to Alex. And I said, well, I, I just feel that, that nobody's taking you seriously. And she said, I feel the same way. And she says, I feel that, that I'm going to be killed. Burnaby RCMP say they did what they thought was appropriate. A spokesman said many of Alexandra's fears could not be substantiated at the time. In retrospect, the spokesman said those fears were probably true. A rally sparked by the death of Alexandra Pesek to protest what they label police in action and the prevention of violence against women. They said Pesek, murdered last week after suffering three years of harassment, was failed by the system. Despite her pleas, she was given no protection. The system failed her. It has failed other women, and it will go on failing more women unless something is done. A fairly significant break in the case was that the victim had hired a private investigator. The head of the firm was a guy named Ozzy Caban. She felt, she felt very strong that she was going to be killed. While she was living in terror, Alex read at least part of that book on Cindy James, 
and then hired the same private investigator that Cindy used. Based on the information that I had received from her while interviewing her, and based on the information I had received on the surveillance reports, uh, we were able to pass this information on to the Coquitlam RCMP who acted upon it. Coming up, what was this key information? And where will it take police as the hunt for suspects kicks into full gear? In the days following the daylight shooting of Alexandra Pesek, a police dragnet closes in around suspects. We now return to Jules Knox and the hired hit. In the hours before Alex's murder, private investigators noted a suspicious vehicle parked outside of her work, which was next to the daycare for her three-year-old son, Brandon. We agreed that we would do a surveillance on the child to make certain that uh, he was okay. One of Ozzie Cavan's operatives was seated in a, in a car outside the daycare. He just happened to notice a white car with another young man with sunglasses, and it was an overcast day, and he thought, well, that's odd. So he made a note of the license plate number. At roughly 20 after 6 last night, Alexandra Pesek and a companion came out of this building where she worked, rounded this corner, and crossed the street to where her car was parked just over here. Her companion went to the passenger side and she got in her car. As she was getting in her car, a red IROC came down the road, stopped here, rolled down its window, and fired six shots, two of them hitting Pesek in the head. An hour after the shooting, the police found the stolen car one and a half kilometers away. It didn't take long to find out that vehicle had been stolen and the license plate that was on the back of it was stolen from another vehicle. Police uh, did the forensic search of it. They found a palm print on the gear shift and uh, uh, fingerprints on the stolen license plate that was attached. Both the palm print and the, and the fingerprints came back to a guy named Lawrence Delorme. So there was hair on the passenger seat. You know, going back in time, like DNA wasn't utilized at the time, so you found hair all right, but it was a little more difficult to make a positive identification from it. At the scene was, of course, a, the victim's vehicle, and on the console of the vehicle, there was a telephone bill with a license plate number written down. The same license plate number written on it as Ozzy Caban's operative had written had written down as well, and a description of a white car with a red top. The registered owner was Milan Nanatic. I guess it would have been the next day we decided to put a surveillance team on Milan Nanatic. And he really didn't do much for three or four days, but on August 10th, five days after the shooting, and the day of the funeral for Alexandra, he's uh, followed to Yalka Pesic's house, that being the mother-in-law, Police watch as the man suspected of stalking Alex before her murder is now meeting with her former mother-in-law, Yelka Pesek. And he got in her car and lay down on the back seat, which I thought was kind of weird. And then they went to a shopping mall. As she drives in the underground parking, they see a fellow sit up in the back seat, and it's Milan and Attic. Why is someone sitting, lying down in the back seat? And they walk into the mall, but they don't walk together, they walk probably 20 feet apart and eventually get back into her car. And same sort of thing, he sits up till they leave the underground parking lot and then when they get out into the open air, he lays down in the back seat again. And then she goes back to where his car is, drops him off, and then the police continue following him. It was uh, a bit of a tough call because we didn't really know what happened there, but it was obviously something. So we said, well, we got to talk to this guy and decided to pull him over. When Milan and Attic got out of, out of the vehicle in the, from the back, he was wearing a pair of shorts and there was a big bulge in his shorts that wasn't there when he went in. And as they approached the vehicle, he got out of his, his uh, car and $30,000 fell out of his shorts. On August 10th, 1992, 
five days after Alex was brazenly gunned down in the streets of Coquitlam. Her body is laid to rest. Pesek's grandmother was escorted into the funeral home amidst concerns for the safety of everyone attending. And that's why both private and police surveillance was everywhere in attendance as the service was about to begin. Alex's final resting spot is the Forest Lawn Cemetery in Burnaby. And at about the time her casket was being lowered into the ground, police made an arrest. After $30,000 in $100 bills falls out of Milan Nanatic's shorts, police tow away his white car that was used to stalk Alex. We uh, did receive a number of tips. However, uh, we were actively investigating the suspects in this case the, uh, the day after the murder. So when did the payoff or the attempted payoff occur? It was today in Surrey. At a private home, or can you say? Uh, the actual payoff uh, spanned through more than one jurisdiction. However, the arrest and the uh, seizure of monies was uh, in Surrey. Was there a surveillance operation going on, sir? Was there surveillance uh, that led up to that arrest? That's correct. After Alex's murder, her friends and family shared details of a nasty divorce battle with her ex-husband, Joe. For me, what led to the marriage breakdown is that the mother-in-law meddled so much in their marriage and that she just couldn't take it anymore. She asked Joe to stand up to his mom, and he wouldn't. Alexander would come home from work, and then Yalka would be in the kitchen making dinner. On one hand, that might sound kind of nice, but not if it happens all the time and there's no privacy. And then it just got worse. And I think the last thing was is that she had gone out one night, her and Joe, and Yelka was looking after uh, the baby. And apparently he was crying and she gave him some kind of home remedy. Alex got home, she couldn't wake her baby up. And so she would took, took him to the hospital and she would never trust uh, the baby around him again. Sam and Yelka Pesek had allegedly helped Joe and Alex out financially. And when the newlyweds divorced, it turned ugly. Court documents say that Sam claimed he had spent $70,000 on materials and labor on his son's house. So he tried to put a lien on the property. They didn't want Alex to get any benefit from the marriage. A civil court judge said Sam created a false contract and fabricated invoices. He ruled that both of those actions were scandalous and came well within the provision for special costs paid to Alexandra. Then came the custody battle. Joe and, uh, and Yelka lost uh, a number of hearings in family court that uh, where they were unsuccessful, eventually ending up in a point where Yelka was denied access to her grandchild. According to a civil ruling, Sam was also convicted of three counts of theft, and he made money in other ways. Court documents say Sam sued drivers in five separate car crashes over six years. And prior to that, he reported 13 job-related accidents, often receiving workers' compensation. Police believe the first suspect arrested in North Surrey was a hired killer. A total of five people were taken into custody. Coquitlam RCMP say three are members of one family. A man and an elderly woman were arrested at a house in Burnaby that matched the address of Pesek's former in-laws. Coming up, Police zero in on yet another suspect in this contract killing. But what was the motive for the murder? Welcome back. Police arrest one of the alleged killers of Alexandra Pesic carrying $30,000 in cash. But the shooter is still at large. We return now to Jules Knox with the hired hit.
Milan Nanadic, Lawrence Delorme, Joe Pesic, and his parents, Sam and Yelka, are all interrogated by police. And it turns out, Yelka is no stranger to the law. Yelka had been shoplifting, you know, a significant amount of times, but it was always for some absolutely trivial thing. I think the case that I, I was working on with her, she shoplifted some chicken livers. So when this incident happened, uh, they were back to me because I was probably the only criminal lawyer that they knew. And so a brazen daylight shooting happens and Alex Pesic is identified as the victim. You're familiar with Yelka. Do you immediately think that she has anything potentially to do with it? No, obviously not. I knew Yelka Pesic to be a, a very quiet, uh, shy woman. What's Yelka like in her interview? Total denial. I had no reason why anybody would want to shoot uh, Alexandra and thought that there was a divorce, but things weren't very bitter. If you're trying to accuse her of something, she's going to fight back. Very unlikely she ever admit to anything. And, of course, protective of her husband and son. What's Sam like? From what I could tell, he was definitely the boss of the family. Like, it was uh, a thought all along, too, that that uh, $30,000 wouldn't go missing from their funds without him knowing about it. But that's just a thought. It doesn't count in court. Yelka had her own money from an inheritance that she received in Yugoslavia. I never saw any evidence that indicated to me that... Uh, that Sam Pesic was in any way involved or that Joe Pesic was in any way involved. And I can tell you that the police did everything they could to try to find a way to show that uh, Joe or Sabo were, were involved, but uh, there was nothing. What was Joe like in his police interview? He was pretty calm, pretty polite, and yeah, denied everything. The victim had hired a private investigator, so they had actually been following her ex-husband that day. First day they'd followed him was that day. And he'd gone to her, her workplace where she had a, her, their son in a daycare. Took him to a swimming pool in Burnaby. He had accounted for his whereabouts, so he was never really, I don't think, very worried about it. Frankly, it was a, a bit of a curiosity. It was almost too good to be true. He had kept the time receipt. I don't know about you, but I've never kept a timed receipt from an entrance to a skating rink or a swimming pool or anything of that sort. So it was, um, it was very uh, convenient that he had that. Fifty-three-year-old Yelka Pesic, Alexandra's former mother-in-law, twenty-eight-year-old Milan Nanatic, and twenty-one-year-old Lawrence Delorme. All three have been charged with the first-degree murder of Alexandra Amber Pesic. After a brief court appearance, the three were hustled into a sheriff's van. Clowns, you're going to get killed in the jail. It's going to be all over. Bitch! 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 Two of the other five that were arrested last night have now been released due to lack of evidence. At the Coquitlam RCMP, Alexandra's former father-in-law was released and is in an emotional turmoil. What can I say? I would have had all my life what they get now. Shit! But you're not charged. Yes, but I have no family.
Do you want a moment to compose yourself? Give us a brief word. I'm sorry, I can't say nothing. What did they tell you about your wife right now? They didn't tell me nothing. Just tell me to go. That's it. Your son? <laughs> He's also to court? No. Your son is being released? Yes. Like you? Yes. Police say new evidence has been uncovered at the home of one of those arrested last night. And as a result, we've recovered a semi-automatic handgun that uh, our crime lab uh, uh, has said is the weapon that was responsible for the death of Alexander Pesic. So you think you, for sure, you have the murder weapon? That's correct. The at the Nanatic residence where he lived with his parents, the uh, gun that was used in the murder was in a closet along with a box of bullets. And there were six bullets missing from this originally full box of bullets. On the night of, of August 10th, Milan and Attic was interviewed and he, he admitted to picking up two guys at, behind the McDonald's. And he was in that white car that Alex and private investigators had both flagged as suspicious. It all kind of came together, and the theory was is that the two men in the in the red IROC sort of drove away and um, dumped the car, and then were picked up by Milan and Attic in the in the white car and driven away. Three people remained in custody: Lawrence Delorme, the getaway driver; Milan and Attic, the middleman; and Yelka Pesic, the mother-in-law. But Alex's shooter was still at large. So as things unfolded, one fellow in particular phoned in and he'd walked down that street where the red Camaro was sitting. And he recognized who he knew as Dave Volk. But Dave Volk was uh, Dave Scoviano's mom's name. We never got the name Scoviano until later. He had an ex-girlfriend. I guess she was kind of a still girlfriend. She phoned in one day and said that he'd been over to visit her and, and told her that he was the guy that shot the girl. Then we had the right name, Scoviano. So they asked her if for her permission to put a wiretap bug in her home and see if she could get him talking about what had happened. He went back over to the girlfriend's place. He was w being way more aloof about the whole thing. He must have got thinking about it and decided he didn't want to tell her too much. He would reply by writing his answer on a piece of paper and then he would flush the paper. And sure enough, you can hear the toilet flush like a few times. So we got a warrant to search the house and um, there was another tenant there. And he said, I remember that day. He said it was welfare day. And uh, Dave had come home and he cut his hair and put the uh, hair in a wastebasket. And he said, it's still there. So of course we seized the hair and then that ultimately was compared to the hair in the, uh, in the IROC, in the Camaro. It was very similar. Coming up, a bombshell revelation at trial from one of Yelka Pelsic's closest friends. Welcome back. Police believe they have found the people responsible for Alexandra's death, including her mother-in-law. But what will the jury decide? We now return to Jules Knox with the conclusion of the hired hit. I can't be happy anymore. I'm just satisfied. I'm satisfied, but not happy. Since the death of her daughter, Alexandra Pesek, Denka Ignatovic says she can never again experience happiness. She came to the Port Coquitlam courthouse hours before the three people accused of murdering her daughter arrived by the back entrance. All three have been charged with the first degree murder of Alexandra Amber Pesek. What's Yelka's demeanor in court? She's very quiet, very non-assuming. Yelka is, uh, you know, in her in her 50s, she's someone who has based her whole life around her family. And so she comes into the courtroom looking exactly like that kind of person. She isn't someone who looks sophisticated or, or even capable of having done something like arrange uh, a murder. 
very cold. She just sat there. She didn't testify. There wasn't a lot of emotion to be seen. It was a packed courtroom every day, but Sam had a place to sit and there was nobody sitting on either side of him every day. Throughout the, the proceedings, the police were convinced, and I think to some degree the Crown, that somehow Saba Pesic was involved in this. But I don't think so. I don't believe that was true. It's hard to imagine your spouse would hire a hitman to get rid of your in-law and then you would still stand by them. Why do you think Sam stood by Yelka? Well, they had a, uh, a very long and trusting relationship. He had stood by her when we were going through the shoplifting incidents. Uh, he had been extremely supportive of her and she had been supportive of him in developing their business and, and raising their family. But not everybody was loyal to Yelka. One of her close friends stepped forward to police. Now her name was Helen Katona and Helen was able to tell the police that Yelka had mailed the Cindy James book to Alexander and there were underlined bits and highlighted bits and this is going to happen to you and you deserve this. Things like being stalked or having a fire set near the home. Helen, she thought they were taking the dog for a walk, and they did, and they went around the corner, and next thing you know, um, Yelka's setting a fire to a tree in, in the front yard of, of uh, Alexandra's home. And, and Helen was going, well, what are you doing? Well, she deserves that. She's, you know, that, it was just nasty. Court heard that a copy of the same Cindy James book that was sent to Alex was found in Yelka's living room. What was the motive? Hate. This is a story about um, a mother-in-law who hated her daughter-in-law, went to a family friend to, to be the intermediary to hire two guys to kill her. So we have the, the driver, we've got the shooter, we've got the go-between, and we've got the mother-in-law. Our theory was is that the mother-in-law was providing the money to these people to do it, and uh, under the criminal code, by definition, a contract killing is a first-degree murder. As you're getting ready for this case, does it feel like it's a slam dunk? This is open and shut? No, absolutely not. It was so hard to believe that a mother-in-law would hire these thugs to go and shoot this young woman in the brazen daylight shooting. None of them confessed and said, yes, you've caught me, I, I, this is what I did. So it was a, quite a circumstantial case. In my address to the jury, I was trying to convince them that she wasn't the mastermind and that there was a reasonable doubt as to whether or not any of the things that she did would have caused someone to commit a murder. Because there wasn't any actual evidence of her going and having a discussion with the addict. There wasn't any actual evidence of her having said, will you do this for money? Today, 15 days after it began, Alexandra's mother went to hear lawyers for the accused and the Crown sum up their cases. Yelka Pesek's lawyer contended that his client was nothing more than a pawn in a deadly chess game of murder. He said she was incapable of contracting to have Alexandra murdered and that no hired killer would deal with her because she had a mouth as big as all outdoors. He did, however, say that someone else in the Pesek family may have arranged the hit. But there wasn't a shred of physical evidence to convict Yelka. Alexandra's mother was overcome during the summation and continued to weep after leaving the courthouse during the lunch break. In the afternoon, the Crown countered, saying that even though the evidence in this case is circumstantial, don't be fooled into believing that that evidence is second rate. It isn't, and the case against Yelka is overwhelming. The next morning, I was in my office, and we got a call saying the jury's got a verdict which was way faster than anybody expected. And that's, that's usually a bad sign for the Crown. David Segoviano, Lawrence Delorum, Milan Nanatic, and Yelka Pesic are all found guilty of first degree murder. What was the reaction in the courtroom? Emotion. The mom, sorry. But it was the mom I really felt bad. Still there. She just bawled. They were sentenced to life without parole for 25 years. In closing, the judge said that they had been found guilty of the cold-blooded execution-style murder of a young mother. 
Are you going to let your wife do that? Do you feel bad at all, Mr. Pesek? How do you feel now, Mr. Pesek? If anything, you say a fault, sir. Don't you feel guilty, Any Mr. Pesek? Any Mr. Pesek? I'm very unhappy. It's uh, a very difficult case, a very tragic case. It's taken a, a great toll on the jurors and on the council and on the families that are involved. Hi. Jamaica, your thoughts? I'm very satisfied. I can't say that I'm happy, but I'm very satisfied. You got it. The justice is done. Thanks to God. Thanks to the, my friends who was all those days with me. And uh, I hope that people who is responsible finally realize that law and justice is about the money. Thank God this turned out the way it did. Mm -hmm. I was so scared. Is it, is it over now? Is it almost over now? No. I mean, the fact that Alexandra's gone forever, that's always going to live on and always going to be very sad. That's it's hard been, to feel it's happy. It's really hard. Mm -hmm. But we're happy that somewhat justice has been served. Mm -hmm. Yelka spent the next 15 years behind bars. In 2008, she applied for early parole at what's called a faint hope hearing in front of a jury. Yelka maintained her innocence. She always, she maintained that she was not, she was not the killer, that she was not a murderer, and that she was an innocent person wrongfully convicted. And she just continued to spew um, hatred and vitriol. Every time I cross-examined her about you know, and, and well, you'll agree with me that Alexandra was a good mother. No, she wasn't. She was a terrible person. And she was, she was just, she could say nothing nice about Alexandra. It was quite something. And the jury obviously just were not at all satisfied that uh, she had any remorse, that she had accepted any responsibility. And she was required to spend um, the full 25 years before she was eligible to apply for parole. While behind bars, Milan Nenadek said that it was actually Sam Hesek who ordered Alex's murder. According to parole board documents, Nenadek intended to extort more money from Sam Hesek after Alex's killing. Milan Nenadek told us more information about what um, they had been hired to do. He told us that uh, they were going to get a bonus if they shot and killed her on her front lawn so that her mother would see it. Those allegations have not been proven in court, and Sam was never charged in Alex's murder. In 2018, Yelka was released on full parole. Sam and Yelka are still living together in the same house they shared when Alex was murdered. Alex and her music have forever been silenced, but her son Brandon grew up. He was raised by Alex's mother. Okay. Give me your hand. As an adult, Alex's son Brandon did again face his paternal grandmother Yelka at her faint hope hearing. Joe, his father, showed up at Yelka's hearing as well, and Brandon told me that was the first time he had seen um, his father in years. It was hard on him. It was a very difficult thing for him to have to testify and face his grandmother, and he also told me that his last name is Pesek. And, and he thought about changing it to um, his grandmother's name, his mother's maiden name, and then thought, you know, no, I am who I am. In fact, Brandon became a mechanic, just like his father Joe and grandfather Sam, although Brandon does not work at Sam and Sons. But his dad, Joe, can still be found at the family auto repair shop. He said, he did not have anything to do with Alex's murder. One year after Alexandra's death, criminal harassment became a crime in Canada. Sadly, the change came too late for Alexandra Pesek. I'm Anthony Robarts. 
Thank you for joining us tonight on Crime Beat. Want more episodes of Crime Beat? Listen to the Crime Beat podcast now for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your favorite podcast. And for past episodes of Crime Beat, go to the Global TV app, visit globaltv.com, or check out our Crime Beat YouTube page.